Well, open your Bibles to Matthew 25. We're going to look at the parable of the talents. You're probably familiar with the story. It's a very familiar one to all of us as Christians. And if you're not, then we'll take the time to read some of it again. But obviously, we're talking about the one talent man, which got everybody's interest this morning. Steve said it was about him. And I know he's not here tonight, so <laughs> he figured he didn't need it. But I told Steve, I said, no, I know you have at least two talents because you can brag on me once in a while, so I appreciate that. And then Gail said she was more than happy for me to preach on one talent, so I thought that was funny. <laughs> Gail didn't like that wasn't exactly what you said, but it's close enough. I think she said I was, I'm more than happy to have one talent or something like that. But if you think about it, look at verse 13, because we know the parable, sometimes we forget what it's all about. But in Matthew 25 and verse 13, Jesus says, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. That's what the parable illustrates. And so the lesson is, you need to be ready, and also you need to recognize the uncertainty of, of the future, whether it's the end of your life or the end of time when the Lord comes back. How many of us can even visualize the fact that this might be the last service before the Lord comes back? It's hard because we've never seen it. But when it does happen, it will surprise whoever is alive and remaining because unlike some of our denominational friends, there are no signs of the Lord's second coming. Now, they misunderstand the destruction of Jerusalem and try to apply those signs to the end of time instead of the end of Jerusalem as a nation, a city. But tonight we need to ask ourselves, am I ready for the Lord's coming <clears throat> because I've done all it's my duty to do and do I realize that this could be my last opportunity because putting things off or delaying is one of the worst enemies that we can have. So everybody has an application to this lesson. Considering that none of us know the future, none of us know when the Lord will return, we need to think about our responsibility and the willingness to prepare now because tomorrow may be too late. So think about the three men in the parable. <clears throat> one had one talent. Another one was given how many? Two. And the other one was given five. Very good. You do know that. So here's the one talent man that seems to get overlooked other than the fact that we kind of finished the parable with him not doing his job. But we want to notice some things about the one talent man that he had in common with the two and the five talent men. First of all, he accepted responsibility for the one talent. If you notice in Matthew, <coughs> Matthew 25, it says in verse about um, 17 or 18, but he who had received one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. He didn't say, well, if I only get one talent, I don't want it. He didn't say, no, you take it or you give it, you keep it. He took it and he went and did something with it. So doing so, he accepted responsibility. And I've always said, and we've always said the Bible teaches ability which his one talent was, plus the opportunity, the time when the master went away for a long period of time, equals one's responsibility. And you say, well, he just had one talent, so he wasn't as responsible as the two-talent man or the five-talent man. And actually, if we look at the text more carefully, we'd have to disagree with that statement. Because what we learn is that he had all that he could use. Let's go back and look at that again. He <clears throat> said in verse 14, The kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. <clears throat> and to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to what? His own ability. That's all he could handle. But he could handle that. And he accepted that responsibility. Now, we need to think about that because so very often we excuse ourselves about, well, I can't do this, I can't do that, I can't do something else. Well, that's the one talent man. We'll see more about him later. But we need to do what Jesus Christ has given us to do. And if you just have one talent, then God expects you to use it. 
And so he tried to excuse himself. But, you know, if, if you read the Bible and look up the word excuse, God doesn't care for excuses much at all. In Romans 1 and verse 20, he says, The creation of the world clearly testifies to the Godhead of Jesus Christ and of the Father because those who look at creation are without excuse. And then in Romans 2, he starts in again. You are inexcusable, O man, you who judge another and do the same things. Do you think you'll escape the judgment of God? So God never likes excuses. We need to keep that in mind when we're making ours. 2 Corinthians 5, 10, so we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive according to the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. You're going to give an answer for your responsibilities in life. And so it was with this talent man. He just has one, but when the Lord returns, he expects to receive from him just like he did the others. And the sad thing was he wound up losing his talent. And that's true in life. If you don't use an ability, if you don't use it, you lose it. And that's true of all of us. And so we need to keep that in mind. So as we back up again and think about the second point, he had all that he could use. We all have different abilities and different blessings. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, when the spiritual gifts are being distributed by the Holy Spirit, of course, the Men who spoke in tongues bragged about their tongue speaking and they kind of downplayed the guys who had prophecy or the one who might could heal or do some of the other things. But in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 11 in explaining the fact that you don't need to be bragging about your spirit given gifts because the same spirit gives all the gifts. So it's not about you tongue speakers. It's not about you prophets. It's not about you healers. It's about God working through you to accomplish his purpose. And so all these men were simply instruments by which God could do his work. And in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 11, he says, One and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. So not only is that true in this parable of the talent man, God gave, according to their ability, what they could handle. But he did it in the church as well. And he does it today. Today we have natural talents and natural abilities. And the third lesson we're going to learn is that you're expected to develop that talent. It doesn't just come full blown. It's something you're given. You're supposed to do something with. That's a great lesson for our kids going off to college. Don't just go with what you have. Develop it and make it better. I noticed something growing up as a kid. My athletic talent was somewhere in the middle. I wasn't the best by any means, and I certainly wasn't the worst. And I know that because when I grew up, like a lot in my age, we played sandlot baseball. A bunch of guys get together in the neighborhood. We'd go out to an empty lot and play ball. Well, how do you play ball? You take all the guys you got. Let's say we had ten, and you divide up two teams. Well, the two supposedly best players are the captains, and they pick the other guys. Well, guess who gets picked last? The worst player. And some of our neighborhood friends who were always picked last kind of got offended by that. But I know I was not that bad because I never got picked last. I was always somewhere in the middle. Occasionally, if the wrong guys didn't show up, or right guys didn't show up, I got to be captain. But the point is that each one had a certain amount of ability, but they could develop it if they tried. And so the funny thing was, growing up and going through school, You could see some of these guys, for some reason or other, and girls too, they would just naturally take to a sport. For example, if you're playing basketball, some of the kids in first grade just knew how to play basketball. And as they grew up and got older, where they could hit the rim, they they made the shots, they stole baskets, they did things that the other kids didn't do. And so they were touted as, oh, this is the great player on the team, and all the rest of you guys need to play like him. And so he would puff his chest out and he'd play better than everybody else. But it all came naturally, which was interesting. But now the kids who weren't quite as good and had to work at it, they just kept on working at it. Third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, junior high. By the time they reached high school, you know what I saw happen more than once? The average player was working on his talent and developing it, while the guy who was so good early on is just sitting back saying, I'm wonderful. Until all of a sudden, the fellow who's been working his talent passed him up. 
know, if a kid who was naturally talented, naturally gifted, but didn't work hard, he'd pout and sometimes quit. And I thought, well, you just didn't develop your talent. Had he worked as hard as the other fella, he could have been even better by the time he reached high school and maybe gone to college and won a degree that way. What's the point? Develop the talent you have and don't use having just one talent as an excuse. Uh, because God's given all is at least one, right? Maybe that's why we, this resonated with us so much. But look at 1 Corinthians 3, where again, Paul and God explain that you and I are nothing more than persons, avenues, tools through which God does his work. And sometimes preachers get a big head because people say how great they are. And they think they are, and they start listening to it. As I say, they start drinking the Kool-Aid. And pretty soon, they think they're important. Let's read 1 Corinthians 3 and see what God says about that. He said, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gave the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. Now again, the five-talent man got five talents because he had five-talent ability, right? The two-talent man received two talents because he had two-talent ability, and the one-talent man received one talent because he had one-talent ability. If they had all done the same thing, and that is develop their talents, the five would have produced ten, the two would have produced four, or rather two more, and then the one-talent man would have produced one more, right? And everybody would have been on even keel. So what's the problem? Somebody says, well, the five-talent man got five. Yeah, but he's just a tool. The two-talent man got, he's just a tool. It's to do God's work. God gives the increase. It's not he who plants or he who waters because God is the one that gives life to the seed. And so that's how we remain humble by realizing whether I'm doing the work a one-talent man does or the work a five-talent man does, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, and that's all God asks of me. So we need to keep that in mind as we think about these things. Some are blessed with better health. Some are blessed with more ability. Some learn very quickly and very easily. Some are more zealous. They just naturally have a zeal. But whatever these circumstances are that are sort of beyond our control, that's not what you and I should worry about. Some grow faster. Some seem to overcome obstacles more easily than the rest of us. But we still achieve what we achieve, as I said this morning, mostly by the choices we make. You just stop and think about that. Your life is going to be molded by your choices. And the more important choices are made very early in life because they have long-lasting ramifications. Kids going off to college, that's a big choice. Not going, well, if you don't have the talent to be a college student, then go learn a trade. There's, there's no shame in that. But learn to do something. And that's a choice. Choosing to do nothing, burying your ability in the ground, is a bad choice. And yet I've seen people do that. And it's really a bad choice because you're kind of like the fellow in our story here. But ultimately, our resources, however meager we may think they are, should be used for one purpose, and that's glory in God. Let your light, your talent, your ability, so shine before men that they may see your good works and do what? Glorify the Father which is in heaven. And in our parable, and I think Jesus must be the master in the parable. The one talent man excuses himself from doing what he should do. But, well, you're a hard taskmaster. You reap where you do not sow. and You gather where you've not planted. So because you're such a hard fella, I was afraid and I went and buried my talent in the ground. There you have what's yours. Well, how selfish is that? And the answer is quiet. So we're not to be concerned about the size or the quality of of the gift, just use the gift we've been given. Let me illustrate it this way. Anybody ever been to Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum? 
I've seen some older folks when they have an estate sale, it kind of looks like Ripley's, believe it or not. <laughs> it's like, how old are these things and how long have they been there? When you start seeing green Tupperware or green dishes, you know what I'm talking about. But in this Ripley's Believe or Not Museum, they have a block of iron or steel. I guess it's iron. Don't say steel. Iron. And just as a block, it's worth about $5. But then on this sign, it says, if it was made into horseshoes, that same $5 block of iron would be worth $50. And if you take and make needles out of it, it's worth $5,000. And if you take that same iron and hone it down small enough so that it makes very fine springs in expensive watches, it's worth even more. But it's all the same block of iron, right? Well, that's what the Bible's trying to tell us. You use your ability according to what you're able. First Peter chapter 4 and verse 10, the Apostle Peter wrote and said, As each one has received a gift... Minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Why were the spiritual gifts given in the first century? Well, the tongues figure was to do it for the benefit of the church. The prophet was to do it for the benefit of the church. The healer was to do it for the benefit of the church. They forgot about that and started saying, look at me and how great I am. No, you received a gift use that gift, but you use it to the benefit of everyone else. And when you do that, you're being kind and caring and you're thinking about others more than you're thinking about yourself. And don't worry about limitations that you can't control. Whether it's a limitation of your time, your station in life, your health, your knowledge, your courage. Just use what God has given you to the best of your ability and do what you've been told to do. Start with what you do have and go from there. Somebody says, well, I have talent, but it's really hidden. (laughs) Well, start digging early. Dig that hidden talent right out of the ground and do something with it, and God will bless you. Because the ones who worked all received twice as much, didn't they? So God cares as much for the little things as the big things, and that's something we learned in this parable here. And so keep that in mind. Well, the last thing we want to, or the second thing we want to look at is he tried to excuse himself. Well, I, I, I just couldn't do it. And I thought, boy, I've heard excuses all my life about why we don't do what we should do, but God doesn't like it. His alibi was he was afraid. He tried to blame his circumstances. But the same is done today, and it's awful often preferable as a good excuse. Let me give you a couple of excuses that have actually been offered by people. These are not made up. One fellow, and I think this is on an insurance, and you'll appreciate these. You probably have some more. One was, I was driving my car and the tree jumped out at me. One kid at school said, I don't have my homework because I got mugged. I offered my watch and lunch money, but all they wanted was my homework. <laughs> And another said, if I don't get my welfare money soon, I'll be forced to lead an immoral life. (laughs) Well, there are no excuses on the judgment day, as we've already seen. Romans 1.20. The creation testifies to our creator, so we're without excuse. Chapter 2 of Romans. You know God's words, you're obligated to do it, and if you don't, you're not excused. And so we all say, well, I can't do that, or I can't do... You know what you need to realize? God's going to be the final one to decide whether you could or not. Because sometimes we say we can't, and what we really mean is I don't want to. Well, if I have to do that, that's extra work. I don't have to do extra work to go to heaven, do I? I don't know. How many talents do you have? Oh, I don't know. Well, you better find out because there's two people who know you and God. So the elders may say, well, they're not going to do that because they're not able. Preacher may say, well, nobody can make them. I can only tell them what their responsibility is. So it falls on your shoulders to find out what your talents are and to use them to God's glory. And if you don't, guess what? <clears throat> You're going to be a given, have to give account for it in the judgment day. And that's between you and the Lord. And as we said at the end of this lesson, he lost his talent. That's sad, isn't it? 
But then what, what difference did it make? Because he wasn't using it anyway. And so he said, chapter 25, verse 24, He who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you've not sown and gathering where you've not scattered. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. That was his excuse because listen to the Lord's answer. His Lord answered said to him, you wicked and lazy servant. There's the problem. He didn't want to. He was lazy. He didn't want to put the extra effort in. Now, is that us? Say, so, well, I can't do that. No, I don't want to because I'd have to work harder. Well, are you lazy? You have to ask yourself, well, I've done a lot of this, that, well, so have I. But when do you quit? Retirement's in eternity, isn't it? Or when you get to the age physically where you can't do it anymore, but until then you need to think about doing what you're accountable for. He said, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed, so you ought to have deposited my money to the bankers and at my coming I would have received back my own with interest, so take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. So what happened to the one talent man? He became a no talent man. What does God do with no-talent people? Well, let's read. It says, And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Yes, he lost his talent, but that's not the worst of it. The worst of it is because he could have kept his talent and developed it, but was wicked and lazy and didn't, he lost his talent and also lost his soul. And all because he just was lazy and wicked. To the others, you hear the blessed words, well done, good and faithful servant. See, we're always just servants of the Lord. We sang the song, make me a servant. I want to be a worker for the Lord every day. That's our job in life. That's our responsibility. We can plant, we can water, but God gives the increase. So if we water and plant and we don't get any production, it's not our fault. You read in the book of Acts, different towns produced different kinds of churches because of the people that were there. Some towns didn't produce any church. They just drove the apostles out. Some, like Ephesus, developed a strong church that was a big influence for many years. Well, what if you're living in a town like Philadelphia that wasn't that big of a deal? Or Laodicea, where they thought they were rich and spiritually well off, and they were just rich. Or Ephesus, you have to do what you can do where you are, and God takes into account your situation in life. And so a lot of times we would do better if we just do our best instead of saying, well, I'm not in a good situation. I don't like what I'm doing here, so I'm just going to quit and lay back and let everybody else do it. That's not the right answer. And so do the right thing and don't be rejected by the Lord. Because in 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 9, The Bible says God will come in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who know not God and those who what? Do not obey the gospel, Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That day we'll all say, I wish I'd done more. I wish I'd done better, and I wish I'd done it sooner. My job is to try to persuade you that now is the time to make those decisions. So ask yourself, would you like to be the one talent man? Regardless of our abilities, many or few, we all have responsibilities. And that is to save our own soul and possibly the souls of others around us. Friends, family, uh, relatives, people that we can influence at school or at work. Every morning you should wake up and say, I need to lead my life in such a way that people know I'm a Christian. Or at least they would suspect that that's the case. And then if opportunity arises, I need to take advantage of it. And also practice prioritizing your life, as we said this morning, Matthew 16, 24 through 27. What does a man profit if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? How can you gain the whole world and lose your soul? By putting your priorities wrong. The world first and the Lord last. And if we do that, we'll gain everything we want in this life, but we'll lose our soul and it's not a good deal. 
And so what we need to realize is let God worry about the results. Be sure we're doing our job. God gives the increase. He's given all of us something to do. Let him worry about the results. Now let me conclude our lesson tonight with a story. A king had need of a faithful servant. He had two talented men who could have both filled the job. So he gave them a test or a task. He said, I want you two to go to this cistern over here and fill your bucket full of water and go over about 20 yards over here and pour that water into this basket. And I'm going to pay you for the hours it takes you to get that job done. You just keep pouring the water into the basket until I get back. So they started doing that. They did, dug the, uh, back, the bucket full of water out of the cistern, went and poured it in the basket. But when they poured it in the basket, the water ran out. You know how baskets are. They don't hold water, right? A woven basket. So the second one did that a couple of times. He said, that's stupid. There's no reason to take the water out of the cistern and pour it in the basket because the water just runs out. I'm not doing that. I'm no fool. I don't know what the king thought, but I'm, I quit. The other one said, well, you know what? He paid us to work until he comes back. I'm going to give my master an hour's work for an hour's pay. So he just keeps on all day long, emptying one bucket after another. And finally, at the long day's end, he gets to the bottom of that cistern and looks down in there, and there's something very gold and shiny. Turned out there's a very valuable ring that had fallen in the cistern that the king wanted back. And the servant that was faithful said, Oh, now I see why the master wanted us to do this. If that ring had gotten into a bucket of water, when I poured that water into the basket, it would have been in the bottom of the basket. And if it didn't, I would find it at the bottom of the dry cistern. And the lesson that we should all learn is this. Do what God tells us to do and let him worry about the results. The king knew these two men. And he wanted the one who said, I will do my master's bidding, even if I don't understand why he wants me to do it. And that's the lesson for us. So tonight, if you think, well, I'm just a one-talent man, I'll guarantee you one thing. You use that talent, you develop that talent, and you'll be a two-talent, five-talent, ten-talent person, and God will bless you for it. If you don't because you're afraid or you don't think you can or you're lazy, And let this lesson be a warning to you because you're passing up your opportunities to do something wonderful for the Lord. Use the talent you have, whether much or little, and just let God worry about the results. Is that fair enough? If you'd like to obey the gospel tonight by giving your heart and your life to Jesus and saying, you know, I may just be a one-talent person, but I'm going to use that talent for the Lord. I'm going to put him first in my life, confess my faith in Jesus as the Son of God and Savior of my sins. Be baptized for the remission of sins. Arise to walk in new life. And that new life means putting him first and doing whatever he requires me to do. I'm not going to let circumstance or things I can't control or my health or lack of it keep me from doing what I can do. I'm going to do the very best I can. When I was a young preacher, I think I've told this story before, but at Yellville, Arkansas, we had a business meeting. We didn't have elders. And the men sat around the whole time convincing everybody else they couldn't do anything. I'm fresh out of college. I'm ready to save the world. I want to get going. Let's get this church alive and moving. And they would always say, well, if you want to, Brother Goff, go right ahead. So I had a newspaper article. They didn't want to, but I did. Had a bulletin we mailed out. Well, we've done that before. It never worked. But we mailed it out and got responses. Uh, If I wanted to go knock on doors, go right ahead. But we're too busy. And so as a young, enthusiastic preacher, it's this, this, this. And not one time in the two and a half years I was there did anybody ever volunteer to do anything except a fellow who probably had less than one talent, Brother Lowers. He was a member of the church. He was probably 80 years old, and he was hired by the church to mow the yard. Imagine an 80-year-old man mowing grass. And they paid him to do it, and he was a member of the church, and he was always faithful he had that strange wife of his who was a Pentecostal preacher. You remember that part of the story? If you don't ask me later, I'll tell you. But he sat there in that business meeting for two and a half years, and toward the end of my stay there, he finally got fed up, and he said, Brother Goff, he stood up. Brother Goff, he said, you give me something to do, 
and I'll try to do it. Boy, it just shamed all those other people. If those men had had any character to them at all, they'd have been ashamed and started doing something. They just sat there and hung their heads. I said, Brother Lyers, thank you. If I find something that you can do, I'll give you the job. But he'd already done enough. He was doing all that he could do and then some. And so it's a shame that the church there died because of that very attitude. And so don't let that happen here. Don't let that happen to you. And don't be the one talent person who even loses that talent. Use yours for the glory of God, and you'll be a happy person. You'll have at least one talent, Gail, right? <laughs> and uh, we'll, we'll be blessed by the Lord in the end of time. That's what it's all about. So think about that as we stand and sing. <laughs>